Yeah, the way, so this, this is, it, uh, I'm sorry, that Tony was supposed to do this part about the three phases, and, and, um, and at this point, we're imagining that one way to think about these transformations is to think about it in terms of the, in some ways, rebirth of metropolitan struggles, or re uh, rebirth of struggles in the metropolis and against the metropolis. And this goes for us with a hypothesis, let's say. Um, and this is what I want to try 10 minutes to explain this hypothesis. Um, that, as I'm saying, it's, it's, a, it's a way of, of recognizing the concreteness and the context, the time and the space of, of, the, of, the, current, of the current cycle of struggles. The hypothesis is this, um, is that the, the metropolis is to the multitude what the factory was to the industrial working class. So I want to try to explain that for 10 minutes. As usual, it's not quite right. You know, there's some, it, um, I think that the, the uh, part of our excitement in, in, in recognizing the uh, intensity of the common, which I'll explain in a minute, in the metropolis, it's not meant as a saying, oh, those people in the countryside are stupid, they don't do anything, struggles in the countryside don't matter. It's rather trying to recognize the qualities of the metropolis that in some ways have been spread over the entire world, the, the qualities of communication, of cooperation, of uh, common struggles and common exploitation that had, in an earlier period, been isolated to the cities. In difference from the countryside, I think they've now been expanded. In any case, let me try to explain what I mean by this. Um, that the that the metropolis is to the multitude what the factory was to the industrial working class. And, and I've got three, three uh, ways in which the metropolis functions as the factory did. First, as the site of production and creativity. Second, as the site of exploitation. And third, as the site of rebellion. So uh, I want to give an idea of that. For the first, the site of production, the, the easy way of saying it, and I want to get, do the complicated way, of course, because that's the way we think. But um, the, the easy way of saying it is just that uh, it clearly the factory and the isolated site of the factory, the factory walls, no longer delimit the primary site of production in society. Rather, uh, production takes place across the social space. And so that in, in say that when we say that the metropolis rather than the factory is the site of production, we mean there's been a kind of generalization of the site of the production, of, of capitalist production throughout the city and throughout the, throughout the society. Um, in order to explain this, I have to go back to this other hypothesis, which I'll do briefly, that Tony and I have been trying to develop for quite a long time in different books, which is about the shift in the hegemony of the form of labor today. Yeah, so take this as a, as a, I have to take this detour. If you get bored by this kind of thing, think about something else, and I'll bring it back in a few minutes. The, so the, uh, the, the idea is this, that in a previous stage um, of the economy, the industrial labor, industrial production was hegemonic. That more or less from the mid-19th century to the late 20th century, industrial labor was hegemonic, not in the sense that most people worked in the factories. Even in Europe, it wasn't that most people worked in the factories. Throughout the world, most people still worked in the fields. But rather, the factory was hegemonic in production in the sense that its qualities, so not in terms of quantity, but in terms of its qualities, were progressively imposed over other forms of production and over society as a whole. So that mining had to industrialize, uh, agriculture had to industrialize, and society itself had to industrialize. It had to adopt its machines, it had to adopt its, its time, its rhythms, its time precision, its time discipline, that all of our lives had to be divided by the clock, the same way the factory work did. And so progressively, we, society has industrialized in that way. Um, even the division between the working day and, and non-work was determined by the factory regime. So the, the hypothesis now, and this part doesn't seem to be controversial, is that industry, industrial production, no longer has the hegemonic role in, in, in the economy as a whole. It's, not, it's no longer able to impose its qualities over, over other forms of production. The part that you might not agree with, and of course might not be right, is that instead of industry now, what we call biopolitical production is occupying the hegemonic role. And now again, I don't mean, of course, 
hegemonic in the sense that most people are primarily involved in that, but rather in qualitative terms, that its qualities are being imposed over other forms of labor. And what we mean by biopolitical production, or sometimes we say somewhat badly, immaterial production, we mean the production of goods that have a primary immaterial component, like the production of ideas, the production of images, the production of affects, the production of codes, so that not only people like at Microsoft doing software are producing immaterial things, but also precarious workers working in service at, at, at Burger King and, and, and also flight attendants or people working in healthcare are producing immaterial things like a healthcare worker, uh, for instance, of course does material production, stitches up wounds or changes bedpans or something like that. But also a large part of the job is an affective production uh, that's also clearly gendered, obviously, that uh, the production of affects like the production of a sense of well-being or the, this, the, the classic study in U.S. sociology is about flight attendants. The flight attendants, of course, do material things, but most of the job of a flight attendant on an airplane is to produce affects, to produce a sense of well-being, to be nice to people who are being jerks. That's, that's a lot of what the job entails. That's a lot, of course, what the precarious service, service sector entails, is being nice to people, even exploiting our ability to be friendly, to love, etc. This is... Um, Part of what's exploited. So the claim is that this, that this whole circuit of series of uh, aspects of biopolitical production or immaterial production is becoming hegemonic today, and its qualities are being imposed over over the um, over other economic forms, other other over other forms of production. What what we would claim is that this that this biopolitical production both rests upon and produces the common. Now, what, what we mean here by the common is not just, uh, it, it might come from an earlier pre-modern notion of the commons meaning like common lands or common forests, even the common earth that's given to us all, something like that. That's the Christian way of saying it. We think of the commons more importantly, let's say, as the common that we all produce. So that, that when we produce ideas, when we produce social relations, we are producing common things things that are resistant uh, and difficult to transform into private property or into public property. So uh, languages we produce, affects we produce, these are things that are, that, are not, that are common that we produce and they rely on access to the common. For instance, you can't, uh, the production of images requires a whole um, visual sensorium of common images and, and, and common goods. Or even if you think about scientific labor as part of this, the production of scientific knowledge, of course, relies on an open access to a common wealth of scientific knowledge of previous productions. So that what biopolitical labor involves really is a kind of expanding cycle of the common. It has to rely on common, an openness to common elements, common relationships, common gestures, common affects, and that through the production creates more of them. So that's the way we have to see production in this biopolitical cycle is a kind of um, expansion of and return to uh, the common. Now, it, so the claim then, now I'm ending this claim, and so if you were not paying attention to this part, come back. Um, the claim is that with this, uh, that we're entering a period of the hegemony of immaterial production or biopolitical production in which the common plays a central role. And this is being, in effect, that its qualities are being generalized um, across society. So this is one consequence of what the metropolis is to the multitude. The metropolis is, in a way, the space of the common. What, what is the city, after all? The city is not just the, the, the physical structures, the buildings. The city is also the relationships we construct. Um, the city is the, the living elements that's, that's the, in a way, sedimented elements of our, of our previous productions of, of the common. That's what the metropolis is. So it's in that way, that's my first point, was that the factory is how the factory, how the metropolis is like the factory for the multitude. Yeah, the hypothesis was, I'll go back to it, so that the metropolis is to the multitude what the factory was to the industrial working class. It's the site of its creation of value and the particularities of it. It's also the site, then this is the second point, of its exploitation. And so what this often involves here is the, is the exploitation of the common. How, what do I mean by the exploitation of the common? In some ways, it's simply the privatization of these common elements. I mean, what neoliberalism is all about is the privatization both of public property but also the privatization of the common. 
And see there, the common we would have to divide again. It's neoliberalism is all, partly about the privatization of common natural resources, privatization of, of oil in Uganda, or of diamonds in Sierra Leone, or, or water and gas in Bolivia. But it's also about the privatization of the common that we produce, that exploitation of the, of the, of the common elements that we produce together, the ideas and affects and, and code and, and, um, and images. One way you can see that again in the city as the site of that exploitation is in terms of rent. You see, it's at this point that Tony would go into a Marx discussion about the shift. You know, Marx t talks about the trinity of, of uh, rent, profit, and, and, and wages. And, and the part of our idea here is that whereas profit was the dominant term in industrial capital, rent is becoming the, the dominant term in the current phase. Rent, it, both in financial, rent, rent, uh, finance, finance capital really as an exploitation of the common uh, in, in the form of rent. But here I wanted, I was thinking of the metropolis even in terms of property values and gentrification um, as an exploitation of the common. Yeah, think about what property values are. Um, what the economists talk about, they talk about property values of urban real estate in terms of externalities. Because obviously your apartment, you know, the property value of your apartment, rent, let's say, it's not just dependent on the internal value of the refrigerator and the floors and the other things in the apartment. It's really about the common that's external to the property. They call these externalities, the economists do, because they're external really of the market exchanges. But what, what really counts the value of, a, of, a, of urban property is, for instance, the, the cultural dynamic of a neighborhood. Um, in some neighborhoods, it's, it, it becomes a negative thing of uh, either of uh, crime and unpleasant and, and social conflict, but in others, it becomes a positive thing. For instance, the classic thing, the classic cycle of of, 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 of urban real estate is defined by artists moving into a a, a neighborhood with uh, low property values. The artists, of course, create an interesting cultural dynamic. Um, it becomes. There, there's a, in this production of the common that the artists bring, it of course raises the value, which is dependent on the common. Then of course rich people move in. There are all these clubs that, that, that profit from the common, clubs, restaurants, etc. It becomes an interesting place. Rich people move in, the property values rise. It becomes a really boring neighborhood. The artists have to move out. And that's the cycle of, in a way you can see, what is that dependent on? The value, it's the expropriation of the common. So this way, the, it's one way rent Gentrification is one means of that of the metropolis as the site of the exploitation of the common that we produce, of that of that privatization, of that making into private property, of the common which is uh, which is affective and social, the kinds of relations we, we produce. So that struggling against rent, struggling against gentrification, is in a way struggling against the exploitation of the common that we produce. That was my example. Oh, in, in some ways, you have to recognize also with this struggle and exploitation is that there's a contradictory relationship between capital and the common. Um, because every time that the common is privatized, it becomes less productive. This is the thing that open source people have said for a long time, is that when in the face of the internet, when there was common access to information, common access openness to code, was the extraordinarily productive time of, of, of common value within the internet. But as there's a privatization of the common. As information, as code, ideas are closed down by private property, the, the productivity collapses and falls down. I think it's a similar, it's a similar thing to that, that common story I was telling just now about property values and artists in a neighborhood. That, that, the, that the act of expropriation, of privatization of the common, destroys capital's own interests in the increase of productivity and profit. So capital's closed within this um, contradictory relationship about the privatization of the common and, um, and its need for expropriation.